Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! After 10 is the time, and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where we will turn our attention today to a, well, a veritable cornucopia of conversational topics. Um, not least the call from a think tank run by a former aide to George Osborne um, to limit buy-to-let mortgages, buy-to-let landlording, something that you will know, has, well, was, we haven't touched on it that much recently, it was a real bugbear of this programme for quite a long time, and... It just seems, frankly, remarkable that someone who advised George Osborne could now be falling into line with what we've been saying for years. It is one of the most fundamental blocks to uh, younger people ever getting on the housing market. But we will turn our attention to that later in the programme. There's also a... Well, it's a bittersweet story, actually, about dads increasingly going to court in order to get more access to their children. Bittersweet because they're going to court, but also, of course, it means they're taking more interest historically than perhaps some dads have done after parents have split up. It was going to be a Brexit-free day. Woohoo! Until Bloomberg Business reported a, a seven-month investigation into just how some hedge funds apparently made huge amounts of money out of um, events on the night of the referendum vote. So we'll probably have a little look at that at some point in the programme as well. I, I mean, really pretty grim stuff and an astonishing piece of journalism, which leaves some individuals with some very, very big questions to answer. But we'll begin with a question I can't answer. I, I genuinely can't answer. And I've tried a million times, and we probably won't hit 11 o'clock today with um, uh, certainty on the issue. But I quite like it sometimes when, when you've spent the whole weekend working on a book called How to Be Right in a World Gone Wrong. It's quite gratifying to come to work on Monday morning and say, I just don't know. I'm being certain, it's so, so exhausting. Being, being right is so tiring, or at least thinking you're right. So on Heathrow, I just don't know. The other story that you know I swing around like a... I nearly said I swing around like a swing then. You, you, you can tell that I've had a slightly down the rabbit hole weekend. Can we have a simile for swinging that doesn't involve swings? I, I, I swing around like a 1970s suburban housewife? Will that do? No, that doesn't work. With pampas grass in the front garden. Oh, what the pendulum. Yeah, all right swinging around like a pendulum is of course the question of trans women and access to female only spaces that is also in the news today but it might be it might be the story that we don't have time to cover either way there's plenty to get through um the Heathrow story I fully understand why it divides opinion um, I live on the flight path I always took the view oddly that we knew that we lived near an airport when we bought that house and to complain about the airport therefore seems a little bit odd but it's not quite fair to put it like that is it it's not quite fair to suggest that i mean a bit like saying i i, I knew when i bought this house that there was a shop on the corner but it was a it was a corner shop and now it's been transformed into the biggest sainsbury's in the country it's, it's not quite it's not quite fair to say well you knew when you moved in that there was a shop on the corner yeah but it's it's it's, a, it's the biggest sainsbury's in the country now it's just a little corner shop it's just a news agent when i bought the house it's not it's not quite the same um there's also, and, and this is something I'm very keen to do today, as I, as I glance at the uh, geographical relevance and a beautiful tweet this morning. Thank you so much for it. It's one of my all-time favourites. Just, just saying the best thing about DAB radio is I can put him on in Chester and he's still chattering away when I get to the Scottish border. I'm very, very conscious that the rest of the country don't necessarily feel about Heathrow in the way that those of us in the South East do. I mean, it leads the news bulletins because so many of us live in the South East. Uh, but the... the, the ways to make it relevant elsewhere I'd be interested in today. If we were serious, for example, about boosting investment in, in the north of England, couldn't we build a massive airport there? What would be if, if it's a hub through which people travel en route to elsewhere in the world, then why on earth does it have to be near the capital city? It's one of the big arguments I've always heard. Um, then you've got, and oddly, this Bloomberg investigation into hedge funds making huge amounts of money out of um, uh, alleged manipulations makes me feel very naive again because presumably some people are going to make a huge amount of money out of the third runway at Heathrow and some of that money will make its way in political donations into the into the coffers of political parties probably the Conservative Party and my days of thinking that, that you're gonna laugh at me now 
My days of thinking that the men and women in charge of everything were somehow fundamentally decent are long behind me now, long behind me. So maybe there is, when you see Chris Grayling turning up on the telly and, and doing two things this morning, number one, denying that he's responsible for the trains. He is still the Secretary of State for Transport, although I suppose it's possible he forgot temporarily. Chris Grayling this morning denying that he is responsible for running the railways and um, also insisting that the Heathrow third runway is absolutely necessary. I've worked out finally what Chris Grayling's secret is. Chris Grayling has absolutely no idea how ridiculous he is. He doesn't even have the beginning of an understanding of how ridiculous he is. Now, you can only cultivate this kind of delusional level of self-awareness if you are constantly surrounded by people who are quite deliberately not telling you how ridiculous you are. So whenever I see him being wheeled out, and he's one of the only cabinet ministers that does appear regularly on television and radio, albeit that he declined to come on LBC this morning, not, not just on this show, but he, he, he has no idea, so he can just sit there and say words. And because most interviews only last a couple of minutes, there's this finish line in sight when he appears on your television screen or he appears in a radio studio. And Chris Grayling's job is to get to the finishing line. And because he doesn't have the vaguest inkling of how ridiculous he is, he, he, he just focuses on the finishing line and then just says words like, I don't run the railways, it's the Secretary of State for Transport. Um, the probation service has gone into absolute freefall as a direct result of his interventions. We know that his impact on prisons has been an undiluted disaster and then they've given him transport where he says I don't run the railway so as long as the finishing line this is modern media in a nutshell sorry we'll get on to Heathrow in a minute this is modern media in a nutshell right you've got a two or three minute hit it's almost like they start the clock now most people would either be uncomfortable or even dare I say it, incapable of blustering and bluffing for the entirety of an interview while saying absolutely nothing of substance. Can you get me that clip of him on, on BBC Breakfast this morning? Because it is, it's a masterclass, an absolute masterclass in speaking while saying nothing. Uh, truly, um, truly breathtaking. And that's the job, isn't it? it? It just has to get to the finishing line without saying anything, even if it means saying things like, uh, I don't run the railways. So anyway, Chris Grayling's on the telly telling me that the third runway at Heathrow is a very good idea, which obviously leads most sensible people to think it's probably a really bad idea. Boris Johnson swore blind that he would lie down in front of the um, bulldozers in order to prevent the building of the third runway, and he's not even going to be in the country today. Uh, deliberately, one imag imagines a, a finagled overseas trip to ensure that he can get to the finishing line without being held to account for his hypocrisy. But none of this means, right that it is actually a bad idea. The strong argument from where I live in West London is the amount of time these aeroplanes spend circling in the air. And remember, I do want non-London perspectives on this. For example, why couldn't they have built it in Leeds? 0345 Um They spend so much time circling in the air waiting for a spot to land that the amount of pollution and noise pollution like chemical pollution and noise pollution is unnecessarily huge and that's quite a strong argument isn't it chris grading says that we need to build it in order to uh, assume our proper place on the world stage after brexit just words what, what the hell do they mean i've no idea we, I, if there's going to be more flights and how long is it going to be until they're floating around above my house waiting for a place to land again uh, 10 years from now and um, where do all these Things come from 0345 6060973. Are, are we going to be seeing more flights? Are we going to be seeing Heathrow become a sort of spaghetti junction of international aviation? And the question I'd really like to answer, if you can answer it, um, can you tell me why it's good for the British economy to have more planes landing and taking off here on their way to and from somewhere else? Right, it's a genuine question. 0345 because I can see how it could be good for some small vested interests, but why is it good for me and you? What, what, there, that's what it is. Explain why the third, regardless of where you live, okay, so would minimise the amount of flight path relevance that we have here. Regardless of where you live, give me a ring and tell me why you think the third runway at Heathrow will be good or bad for you, for you and your family, for you and yours. That's a nice way into it, isn't it? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. Hit the numbers now, you will get through. And I am gonna put in my hardy perennial, my, my hoary old chestnut, my starter for ten on this, because I know 
well, I think in the past it has exposed me to a degree of ridicule, but I'm only human, and sometimes when I've got an idea that I think is quite clever, I find it very hard to give it up. I've never met anyone that couldn't go on holiday. What? I said, I've never met anyone who couldn't go on holiday. So you've never been sitting in the pub or at work, and someone has said, oh, we couldn't go on holiday this year, there weren't any flights. There's always been a flight available for you to go on your holiday. You might not have been able to get the exact flight you wanted on the exact day that you would have chosen. Uh, flights are often full, but the business model demands that they're full. Nobody wants to be putting aeroplanes into the sky that are half full. So tell me why that's stupid. Why is it stupid to observe when asking whether we need another runway that no one has ever told me they've been unable to go on holiday? And what happened while we're at it? What happened to all the uh, virtual conferencing? And, and, and all the, you know, reasons why we wouldn't need to do face-to-face -face mano a mano business anymore, or womano a womano. What, what, what happened then? I mean, genuine question again. I, this is what I do for a living. I sit on, in a room, I sit in a darkened room on my own, talking into a microphone, utterly unaware of whether anyone's listening or not. It's, it's not what you would call the most face-to-face -face of professions. So in your profession, what happened to the idea that we'd be doing less travel and less face-to-face -face meeting and we would improve the quality of both the environment and the uh, international cooperation by using technology to uh, converse, technology to negotiate, technology to meet? Why do we need all these planes? 03456060973. Um, first line, either you are being obtuse or are simply an idiot. I <laughs> I, frankly, I wouldn't know which way to jump, mate. Um, talking about Heathrow, do you know there was a wonderful little intervention from a Newcastle University academic at the end of last week uh, that Manchester, Leeds and York, he suggested, are all in the south, according to his measures of how dependent you are upon London. Um, you define a northern region by asking where does London end? And he, he drew a map that saw Birmingham, Sheffield, Leeds and Manchester, but, neither, but not Liverpool. Uh, as somehow being in the south because of the influence, the extent of the influence, e economic influence of, of London, which, wow, that's the kind of thing we might have talked about if it was a less newsy day. It's, quite, it, it's about where jobs, how far away from London people who work in London might live or jobs that are dependent upon what goes on within the M25, um, even though they might live outside the M25. So Heathrow is clearly the national hub airport, but I don't know, even after 14 years of presenting this program and talking about it relatively frequently, I still don't really know whether or not we need another runway. Do you? Don't ring me up to agree with me that you don't know. Although it would be fun and it would make me feel less lonely, I'm not sure it would be particularly enlightening radio. Chris is in Burgess Hill. Chris, what's going on? Good morning, James. Hello, Two Chris. points yes. I'd like to raise. Carry on. Firstly, you wondered why the planes are all stacking up over Shea O'Brien. Well, I know why, I know why they are. It's because there, there, there isn't room for them to land. Exactly, because they haven't got an extra runway. They need... Well, no, I just said all this. What, I just said all this. What are you, an echo? Well, maybe when I phoned in... But I hadn't said it. Lesson to us all there. Wait and yeah. see. Wait and see what nonsense I come out with before ringing in to correct it. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I get that, but that, and that's good news for people who live in West mm. London on the flight path. But it's not. It doesn't quite tally with the claims that, that, that this will increase the amount of air travel. Do you see what I mean? Chris Grayling claiming this morning that it will allow us to claim our place on the world stage post Brexit. That's got nothing to do with me having my barbecues disturbed. No, it doesn't. But we do need those extra tourists to come in because that's about the only industry we're going to have after Brexit. But that's not the rationale of the government. So I admire your, your oh, pluck. I'm, and not defending, I'm not defending the government. I mean, Chris Grayling can't defend the government. But he, don't he worry. Doesn't he's not in charge of transport. He's not, he doesn't run transport. He's He's just the Secretary of State for transport. I know, he just busts his nails and looks pretty on the media. So shall we have a little listen to him earlier and see, see if, you think, if you agree with my analysis that he actually just sort of utters words without saying anything? Boris would prefer to build a, a new airport in the Thames, um, in, uh, in the Thames estuary. We've, he's been very clear about that over the years, but we don't think that's either a viable or the right solution. We've had an airports commission that looked at all the options, including a Thames estuary airport. Uh, we've had detailed analysis done by my department, but ultimately tonight it's for Parliament to decide. Have we got it right or have we got it wrong? We think that expanding Heathrow is the best option for Britain. We know there are MPs who disagree with that, who disagree very strongly. In the end of the day, Governments have to take a decision, have to form a judgment. That's what we've done, and we're now saying to Parliament, back that judgment. Do, do you think, Chris, he has a little stopwatch in his pocket? 
that he can sort of feel like a like a sort of braille type stopwatch so he can feel how much longer of the interview is left and that's where he comes out with half of the phrases in that in that response we, we, yes we, and he's probably got set phrases to do yes I mean, neither right nor it's either right or far. viable tick tock tick tock tick tock nearly there nearly there come on christopher you can do it yay we got to the end of another well, interview without saying anything thing, isn't it because yes. otherwise the tick tock would be hit picked up by the microphone yeah, exactly and he probably gets extra excited as it gets towards the end of the interview but um. can steady on chris honestly it's a family program alex is in derry in uh, of course in northern ireland alex what would you like to say uh, good morning, James. Hello, I've been Eric. thinking about the time I was living not far from the Heathrow oh, for yes, many yes. years, and you're quite right about the pollution and the noise, but I think the third runway would help to alleviate that. You can't get up, down, you can't get up because there's no space. So the third runway, I think, would probably help that. Well, this is, you're the second caller to say that, and I've already said it. I, that's the one bit I understand of the whole mess. It's, it, it, it's, it's the stacking, they call it. So but what I don't understand is why, if that is the real reason for doing it, they keep insisting that um, it's going to bring in more business. Where does the money come from? But where do, do, do you see what I mean? Because those planes you describe are already flying in and out of Heathrow. They're just hanging around above my garden for about half an hour waiting for a place to land. Oh, James, I've, sat, I've been circling for an hour, and I, I remember going to Las Vegas on one occasion, we circled for the best part of an hour, until they got a bit of wisdom and got another runway going. It's difficult to say, look, if you're a passenger, you want to get on the ground and off the ground ASAP, not hang around, uh, waiting for a space to land. So, that, so, so that's enough for you? That, but how long will it be before they're all stacking up again, even with the new runway, because there, there's an increased volume in traffic? Yes, well, yeah, exactly. Well, you have a good point. Uh, I think First time I think for everything, Alex. On this, James, you've, you've got me on that one. <laughs> Bless you. 23 minutes after 10 is the time. 0345 6060973. I'm beginning to think that nobody knows. Nobody knows why. Nobody, I mean, a really strong, informed answer to, to why it's a good idea is, with the greatest of respect to Alex and um, vibrating Chris, it, it, it is going to involve surely something a little bit more than, well, they'll be able to land quicker and they won't be hanging around disturbing your barbecues anymore, James. And, and it starts about five o'clock round my way. It's worse out by Windsor. Took a call from the Queen once, Liz in Windsor on line four. My husband and I, we despise the noise. And Windsor can be really bad, really bad. But um, I still don't know, and I want to know. Is it one of those things where you can't know? Is it a known unknown? Is it an unknown unknown or a known unknown? You can't know for sure. But increasingly, if somebody like Chris Grayling tells me it's a good idea, then I am leaning towards the notion that it's a bad idea. And I just, I'm worried that you might think I've done Chris Grayling a disservice when I say that every single time he's interviewed on, broad, on broadcast media, he's got a little vibrating stopwatch in his pocket and all he has to do is get to the end of the interview without saying anything. So just, just, just once again, because it's quite funny, I think, to double check this theory. Here he is this morning elsewhere because he wouldn't talk to, to anyone on this radio station. Boris would prefer to build a, a new airport in the Thames, um, in, uh, in the Thames estuary. We've, he's been very clear about that over the years, but we don't think that's either a viable or the right solution. We've had an airports commission that looked at all the options, including a Thames estuary airport. Uh, we've had detailed analysis done by my department, but ultimately tonight it's for Parliament to decide. Have we got it right or have we got it wrong? We think that expanding Heathrow is the best option option for Britain. We know there are MPs who disagree with that, who disagree very strongly. In the end of the day, governments have to take a decision, have to form a judgment. That's what we've done. And we're now saying to Parliament, back that judgment. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Over the line. Well done. Um, Boris who? Oh, this guy. John McDonald. Yes, John. I will join you. And I will join you. I will lie down with you in front of those bulldozers and stop the, and stop the building. So the bulldozers, I mean, they're not going in today, but the vote tonight will determine whether or not they ever will. So in, in, in strictly legislative terms, Boris Johnson has the chance to metaphorically lie down in front of the bulldozers today, tonight, in the House of Commons. Um, it would involve him, I think, as a government minister, having to resign the whip, which Greg Hans, the international trade minister, did last week in order to keep his promise to the constituents of Chelsea. Is it Chelsea and Westminster? No, it's the hospital. Full, full, Chelsea and Fulham, I think, the constituency. Um, so Boris Johnson presumably will be resigning as Foreign Secretary and doing what he promised he'd do. What? Oh, he's out of the country, apparently. What a surprise. Tony is in Nice. Tony, what do you think? Good morning, James. It's nice to be in Nice. Um, on holiday briefly. But, uh, as, as a is it nice to be in Nice? 
Yes. Well, probably, probably, yeah. Carry on. Um, uh, as a, as a, as a, an airline pilot for some 42 years, I think I know a little bit about the technicalities yes. of, uh, of, 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 the way this, of the way this all works. If you build a third runway at Heathrow, would you like to tell me how long it's going to be before you need a fourth runway at Heathrow? Hang on a minute. You can't ring in being all experty with your 42 years of experience and then expect me to know the answer to your questions. <laughs> no, James, but uh, seriously, uh, it's, it's pretty, uh, as we all know, it's all, it's all congested. The infrastructure around Heathrow is seriously congested. Building runways over the M25 will create a massive amount of disturbance. Yes. And I was just going to suggest that you have a look at that wonderful runway that's about 12,000 feet long down at Manston in Kent, where you could put aircraft almost within a few months as a railway line not too far away with a bit of lateral thinking could have uh, substituted Boris's idea of building in the Thames estuary with something that we've already got well, while they still scratch their heads about where they're going to well, build well, the extra well, runway. Well you're not the first person to suggest that and, I, and I'm not going to claim any particular understanding of, of, of the broader issues but I'm going to do something that, that I, I often do with people who know more about a subject than I do and I'm going to ask you to explain the other side why, why, why do you think they're not doing that? Well, um, that I have absolutely no reason. Uh, that's politics, and I'm and I and I'm not a politician. Uh, there are obviously vested interests in play to do all kinds of things, like there are to build the runway at Gatwick. Gatwick's certainly got more space than Heathrow's got. But I'm looking at it from a, a, a operational point of view. Do you realise that we ca we haven't got freight capacity in the southeast of England at any of our major airports? Gatwick is close to freight. Heathrow doesn't take any freight unless it's in the belly of an aeroplane. And if you want to land freight in a freighter aircraft, you've got to go somewhere like Stansted, get a single runway airport, which is very, very... So, so anyone saying that the third runway is going to increase the amount of business flights, as in full of goods rather than business people, they, they don't know what they're talking about? Well, you can put quite a lot in the belly of an aircraft, but you can't put big things. But you like can put it in the belly of a passenger airport. It's not. It's not a you, freight yes, plane. Yes, 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 yes. You can. Okay. But, but uh, if you if you shift freight around by air, which I've done a lot, you can see how much really big stuff you know comes in uh, and needs to be trucked away from the airport. Heathrow just doesn't have that have that capability whereas somewhere like um dare i say it, manston again has masses and masses of room and was doing that before it was closed down well a strange old business isn't it well it is a strange old business because even if they even if they push the green the, the push the big button on on starting work at heathrow it's going to be years before you see a, a aircraft on the top they like big shiny things is that what it is it's sort of sort of politician i mean the, by this dreadful word well, legacy I, 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 boris johnson envisioned having an island named after him effectively which probably yeah. explains why he was in favor of this ludicrous confection but but politicians they like signing off on really big stuff they, they, they don't like just true. working yeah, out yeah. you know if you're as old as I am, uh, James, you, you, you'd remember that, um, I think it was back in 1976, Ernie Marples was standing on the sands of Maplin, looking down the flare path of the runway that they were going to build then. As soon as Labour got in, they scrapped it. So that was another another idea to build in the Thames estuary, which was oh, really? would have been would have been quite a would have been quite a good idea at the time. Um, before before you before you say goodbye to me, I just want Horrible. to say. That, uh, Okay, oh, thank you. I just want to say that um, uh, one of the things I did before retiring was to fly masses and masses of freight into Brussels because that's the nearest it can get to the UK oh, when boy. it can't land in Britain itself. So we were landing freight in Brussels, which was being loaded onto massive lorries and trucked over and under the channel in order to get it to the UK. Now, isn't that daft? Yes, it's pretty oh, lordy. It's frightening. Frightening, so got Tony. Fra 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 frightening, frightening, frightening. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay. Have a good day, Tony. Enjoy the Riviera. Increasing number of people seem to be listening to me on holiday. I'm, I'm not, not entirely sure that's healthy. Uh, it's half past ten. Sandra Wood, I'm banning you from listening to this programme, OK? Because that message that you've just sent me is, is just beyond the pale. I'm, I'm prepared to cope with the box of trolls and the ludicrous obsessives who spend their entire day tweeting abuse of me. But to tell me that you're currently listening to this programme in the Peloponnesian paradise that is Kalamata has utterly taken the wind out of my broad broadcasting sales. I was there myself a couple of weeks ago. Oh man, I miss it. Seriously, if you get the chance, Sandra, pop up to Cardamilly for dinner. 
Go to the first taverna that you come to as you go over the little bridge on the edge of the town. And I say, tell them I sent you. And they say, what? Who? <laughs> it's a stupid English man who got bitten by mosquitoes so much that complete strangers were coming up to him telling him to go and buy some cream. Yeah, him. 25 minutes to 11. Um, I, I just need to check something technical, all right? Can, I, can we, does it work? Let's see, go show me. Okay, so Boris Johnson, it was reported this weekend, um, was asked by European diplomats how he felt about the increasing number of businesses that were expressing profound and evidence-based misgivings about both the continuing uncertainty surrounding Brexit and, more pertinently, the prospects of us no longer being in the customs union or the single market. And do you know what his reported response was? No? Okay, I'm going to tell you. Business is what he said. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to be a little bit riskier on this one. He said, F business. That's what he said. So the party of business now says, F business. And yet the justification for, for Heathrow, the rationale for Heathrow, is that it's really, really good for business. Do you ever get the feeling that you're being completely played? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three is the number you need if you can tell me something about Heathrow. Incorrigible FCA, as ever, is pouring the cold water of um, evidence and concrete proof upon our otherwise uh, roaring flames of disagreement and controversy. He reminds us that the Davis report into Heathrow, which was considered pretty authoritative, did conclude that Heathrow was the best advantage. The benefits were significantly greater than Gatwick's. He spoke also of... Um, uh, any Gatwick expansion being unlikely to provide much of the type of capacity which is most urgently required, i.e. long-haul destinations in, in new markets. And if it is enacted properly, the £17 billion expansion would include a permanent ban on a fourth runway. And I don't, I don't want to turn into kind of Hounslow FM, but I, that, that those roads around there can't really cope with much more volume and, and, and capacity. You're talking about roads that, that, in many cases, were sort of 100 years old. They're just too narrow. But I don't know. Maybe you do. 03456060973. In answer to the question of why is it so urgent, why are we doing it, um, well, it's when I see numbers like £17 billion, and I, I've, I know that many of you arrived at this conclusion a long, long time ago, and you find my naivety touching. But when I see these people queuing up to get their hands on public money, public investment or, or on institutional infrastructure investment these businesses the the, the ones that actually are the, are the biggest players in town albeit that they operate very much on 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 a kind of on a knife edge carillion being being a very good example but these massive they just see a 17 billion pound contract and they just want some of it right and then the pressure they put on a government in order to announce a 17 billion pound project is, is huge, and the inducements perhaps that they offer in terms of donations and, and support and what have you, I don't know, I'm, I'm sounding like a conspiracy theorist, but £17 billion, I think we could all agree, is an awful lot of money. Uh, Tara, is, oh, of course, unless you're a Brexiter, in which case we could afford to lose it every week. Tara is in Egham to talk to us about Heathrow Airport. Tara, what would you like to say? Hi, first of all, I'm extremely nervous. I've been listening to you for years. This is the first time I've called your program. Is there anything I can do to put you at your ease, Tara? Uh, no. Would, I think you, I'll would, you like me, it. would you like me to use my special treacly voice? <laughs> no, that's okay. okay. I'll just do my best. Carry on. So I, I'm currently living in, in Egham. I live underneath the airplanes. I love them. I knew this when I bought the house. My kids like looking out the window and trying to see if we can see the landing gear. It's most cool. fun. Cool, yes. Um, I know that. But the other the reason I'm calling is not because of my view. It's because um, I have a master's degree in real estate investment analysis wow. from the U.S. And my thesis was on air, the concept of airport centrality. And it really is, for cities, one of the most important, if not the singularly most important factors in economic growth for the area. And we're not talking about the individual jobs for the people who are selling you a sandwich or getting you through security. Yes. But what, what happens is, the concept of what happens is, when an airport becomes increasingly the central point where uh, planes come in, where people switch to another flight, and also proximity to a city, it's about the time that business people, as you're mentioning, how long it takes them to get from whenever they're going to, to, to their place of business. Then what happens, the knock-on effect is, cities will attract, or in, in probably our instance, keep some businesses from leaving because there's a, a huge value in time right. uh, 
So Which, if I can get in and out of the city quickly, is that what you're saying? So forgive me for being a bit yes. slow on the not uptake. Not only that, because even, even here in Surrey, you see a lot of corporates moving their corporate headquarters, even, for example, around Egham, um, around Staines, around, I've seen, you know, bunchers around Walton and Thames, Weybridge. Yes. Um, it's because we're, it's, it's 15 minutes from Heathrow. Oh, and if you're spending, if you're yes. on average spending more and more time flying around, uh, circling, or it's difficult to get flights or whatnot, you're not going to grow those businesses. For example, one of the classic cases is um, decades ago in Atlanta. Atlanta became a major powerhouse business city because they first invested massively in their airports to make it a central location. So someone maybe in Tennessee could more easily get in and out of the airport into a business there, which is hundreds of miles away than, for example, to go to Chicago. Oh, wow. Okay, that makes. I mean, that's a real penny drop moment for me. That's of course right. so it makes sense, and that would also, then that would also explain why it makes more sense to add to the existing biggest one rather than build an entirely new one or, or open up down in, in Manston Airport in Kent or somewhere like that. Yes, because you've got to otherwise reinvent the wheel. The other thing is, you know, airports like Gatwick or Stansted are perfectly well placed for commuters, people going on holidays, families. But in in order to combat some of the the obvious signs we've seen of businesses leaving London or the area, um, there is a monetary value in the reduction of that time of commuting in and out, of A, increasing the number of flights, making them more and more available, and having the transition seamless. You also just mentioned the roads. That's, a, that's another key factor. Yeah. But again, from, I can get to Heathrow in less than 15 minutes. I'm seeing in this area... Um, Ah, because I'm coming from the other direction. I'm seeing, I'm seeing in this area um, headquarters. Yes, you are. Moving, growing here. Do so you know, as I, as I drive up, is it, is, it, is it which road is it that goes past Legoland? Is it, is it the M3? Yeah, yeah. And as I, M3, M4. M3, M4, I drive out I of London, and, and I, 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 Basingstoke, Reading. I, I see these towns, and I see some of the big businesses there, and I think, what are they doing there? Why aren't they in, you know... Central London, and now I understand why. Because they're international businesses. Exactly. They need links. Let's say a business has their, it's a German business, they're, they're looking at London or this or that or even Ireland or whatever. If it's more increasingly attractive, what they're, they're putting a huge premium, premium on flying from their international city to the other international city at a time and then how quickly to get in and out. But if there are always delays, if there are problems, not enough flights, it isn't going to happen. So this is, it, it, in your view, it's, it's not only a good idea, it's, it's, it's necessary to, to protect us, yeah. I mean, whatever one thinks about Brexit, I and I so. should probably reach out a little bit more to people still labouring under the illusion that it's going to be anything remotely positive. But if, we, if we're going to try and induce companies to stay, even though we've restricted their access to the largest single market in the world, then an extra runway at Heathrow is pretty much the biggest yeah. inducement that a government could do. It, it absolutely is. I mean, one of the interesting things that is happening right before our eyes is, look what's happening. Iceland is becoming a hub, is and it? all of a sudden their tourism is booming. Well, I never. You're amazing. What on earth Thank were you, you nervous about? Um, because I, I generally keep to myself. I'm just a... Well, I'm so glad you didn't today. You've, 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 I mean, I, I appreciate that you're, you're one expert, and there might be another expert who would challenge what you've said, but you explained it with such clarity that I, I, I genuinely feel enlightened. Are you familiar with the role that your compatriot Ray Liotta plays on this program? Oh, I love Ray Liotta. Could I have one, please? Oh, it, you are, according to several people who've already texted the program while you were talking, you are what we call a shoe-in for a Ray Liotta talk. Oh, also, I'm single, so if anyone wants to call me up and ask me for a date, that would be good, too. <laughs> I'm Ray Liotta, and you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. If you build it. They will come. But Tara, I mean, your love life aside, that, that's, that's a moment of absolute poetry, isn't it? Because what you've just explained to us effectively with regard to the need for the third runway at Heathrow is if you build it, they will come. Yep. One, one small example, because I go back and forth between the US and the UK, I've dual citizenship. Um, for example, in Ohio, the Cleveland Clinic used to attract a huge amount of international clientele. Suddenly, they eliminated the direct flights from London to Cleveland. Guess what's happened now? Tell us. You might be aware of it. No, go quick. They're building a Cleveland clinic in London because the Saudis and the and the and the whatnots don't want to fly and, and switch flights. Oh my goodness me! Well, well, do you have any other fields of expertise? Do you have any other fields of expertise? Uh, 
I used to be a foreign exchange and equities trader, trader but mostly I, I also really good in the garden. I th well, I think we might put you on speed now. Tara, that was an absolute pleasure for me. One of the finest calls we have ever taken in all the years that I've been doing this program. And we've done this topic countless times as well. I have never heard. You're not going to spoil it now, are you, and tell me that you rang Ian Dale and told him all this stuff last week? No, I, I've literally heard you talk about this topic over and over again, but I've usually been driving or I've been in the U.S. and it's been a weird time for me. or And, and I've just kind of, it's been in the back of my mind. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that today it was in the front of your mind, and I'm glad that we were able to benefit from the fruits of your learning. Rarely has a Ray Liotta been so richly deserved. Thank you, Tara. It's 10.46. And you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Still really just a gog with admiration for the quality of Tara's call. And if you thought I was being a bit unkind to Chris Grayling earlier in the programme by pointing out that he would struggle to punch his way out of a wet paper bag in terms of intellectual capacity, why, isn't, why, why, why couldn't he say any of the stuff that Tara just said? Tara was nervous about coming on the radio, uh, and he, he is so utterly unaware of his own inadequacies that, that he, doesn't, he doesn't even hesitate. He's one of the, well, he wouldn't come on this programme in a million years, and, and he uh, didn't go on the breakfast programme this morning either, but the, 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 the sheer acuity and insight of Tara's explanation there of why the third runway at Heathrow is a very good idea has possibly closed this entire topic down for me for, for a week before I pretend I've forgotten all about it and ask you all over again. I, I, I genuine, I mean that. Well, if, you, if you think I was being unkind about Chris Grayling, just compare his contribution to the debate to, to Tara's. And I, I'm not going to remind you of his contribution to the debate because I have a journalist on the line who writes for Business Week magazine, but more pertinently today is also a reporter for Bloomberg. And there is, to my untutored eye, an astonishing story that has uh, uh, been published today by Bloomberg uh, under the headline, Brexit's Big Short, How Pollsters Helped Hedge Funds Beat the crash. Now, post-Brexit, regardless of how you voted, we, we can all agree that we have a massive media problem in that a lot of the opinion-forming ends of the media, uh, the best-selling newspapers in the country, for example, The Sun and The Daily Mail, were so slavishly behind Brexit that they are ideologically incapable now of reporting anything that casts it in a negative light. And this means that we're genuinely not getting the truth about quite a lot of issues. The, the, the Russian angle or the um, data manipulation would be very good examples. But this story seems to me to potentially eclipse even those. Um, uh, Kit Chalel is the co-author, the co-writer of this piece and joins me on the line now. Where do we start, Kit? Can we, can we start by asking, it's a seven-month investigation, I gather. What was the inspiration for launching it? Hi, James. Thanks for having me on. Um, I guess one of the inspirations for the story was, was Nigel Farage's own words on the, on the evening of the Brexit vote. Uh, in that time period between 10 p.m. and midnight, when we didn't have any real data about what was happening and before any results came in, he gave an interview to, I think it was the Press Association, in which he talked about his friends in the City of London who had done some big private polling. And for us, this idea that uh, a financial institution or a hedge fund could use private polling to inform their trading decisions was fascinating. We didn't know it existed. And so we sort of set down the path of trying to find out what was going on. And what did you find? Well, the main thing we found was that hedge funds hired some of Britain's best known polling firms to help them make a profit on one of the biggest currency crashes in history, which happened immediately after the country voted to leave the EU. And how did they do it? Well. Uh, Part of the reason they could make a profit on this trade was that the financial markets, like many other people, had got this wrong. Uh, they miscalculated the likelihood of a leave vote. And so that made it very cheap for hedge funds to trade the pound, among other things, and increase their potential profits. But they needed to have an accurate gauge of public opinion to do that, and that's where the polling firms came in. So the polling firms then would have been advising these hedge funds that the vote looked likely to go to leave. And when it was publicly pronounced that it looked as if it was going to go to remain, the opportunity to make a ton of money was established. That's one possible trading strategy, yes. You could use the missentiment in the market to buy cheap derivatives, for example. It makes the trading more profitable. Um, but there are, other, there are other strategies you could use. For instance, if you, if you knew, for example, that um, a polling company would be releasing a public poll at a given time. If you knew in advance or were able to predict in advance what that public poll would say, you could trade off the poll itself. You could know how the market was going to move based on the poll. And, and pollsters have told you, many of whom, of course, 
um, all of whom I imagine speak, speak to you confidentially because of uh, confidentiality agreements, uh, they said that they believe Brexit yielded one of the most profitable single days in the history of their industry. Do we, do we, do we have sort of names of, of institutions or individuals that did clean up? Well, we know, for example, that YouGov um, charged about a million dollars to a single financial institution for its polling operation on the day of Brexit. So I think that gives you an indication of how valuable a day this was for the polling industry as a whole. But I think it also tells you, look, hedge funds aren't stupid. They're not going to pay a, a million dollars for information if it serves them no purpose. So it also tells you how useful this service was to them. Uh, you, you, you write in the article, one person with questions still to answer is Farage. He twice told the world on election night that Leave had likely lost when he had information suggesting his side had actually won. He also changed his story about who told him what regarding that very valuable piece of information. That's, that's quite a hefty um, claim. Yeah, I mean, uh, we stand by our reporting on that. I mean, as to, as to Ni why Nigel said what he said uh, on those occasions, you'd have to ask him. In his conversations with us, he said that he was uh, basically depressed about the result and whatever information he was being given that was uh, appeared to be positive, he just didn't believe it. Um, but we do know that he, he was getting information from his favourite pollster, who did a very large City of London private exit poll that was one of the most accurate polls that anyone did. This is Damien Lyons Low. This is Salvation. Mm. Um, their poll, according to our sources, called the result, and they would have known, well, at 10 p.m., if not earlier, that the result was going to look very different the, the, than, than the markets and everyone else was predicting. So we know that Nigel had those conversations. We know that he knew about that poll. Um, uh, you know, and as for his explanation, it, it isn't clear. He changed his story several times. You could, you could always ring him on LBC. <laughs> Maybe next time. Maybe next time. Um, and I've seen Robert Peston, the uh, political editor of ITV, a uh, former economics editor at BBC, uh, suggesting that this is the sort of story that the Financial Conduct Authority and the Bank of England might want to look into. First of all, would you agree with that? And secondly, why? why? I mean, what, what kind of potential transgression have you, have you identified in layman's terms? Well, in terms of the, the outcome of our story and what happens next, that, you know, those are decisions for other people to make. Um, one possible outcome is there will be more scrutiny of polling industry and private polling. Uh, polling. Polling companies largely regulate themselves. They have a self-regulatory body called the BPC. Um, in the past, they've faced questions about their impartiality in terms of politics and the accuracy of their surveys. But because hardly anyone knew about the nature of their work for financial firms, there hasn't really been any scrutiny of that. So one thing that may happen is people will ask more questions about those things. In terms of the law, um, again, you know, these, these are questions for a lawyer to answer, really. Um, but there are certain areas of law that come into play here. The main one is a UK law that specifically covers exit polls, where you've asked someone how they voted. And it's illegal here to publish the result of an exit poll to the general public or any section of the general public before the vote has finished. But so that, so there's, that, no, there's no way that a, that a hedge fund could be exempt from the description of being a member of the general public, is there? Or? Well, one, one legal expert we, we spoke to called it a grey area. It's, oh, it's, really? an, it's, an, it's an area of law that just simply hasn't been tested. Um, so we, we just don't know. So um, watch this space. Perhaps. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's an astonishing piece of work, absolutely comprehensive. I, I, I'm tempted to ask what you're going to work on next, but I don't imagine you're going to tell me. <laughs> That would be confidential. <laughs> <laughs> Kit Chanel from Bloomberg. So thank you so much. Co-author of this article with Cam Simpson and Gavin Finch. Uh, you, you can find Bloomberg pretty easily just by, by Googling it. Or if you follow me on Twitter or indeed Robert Peston or, or Gina Miller or, uh, well, pretty much everybody with any credibility at all in the context of uh, economics and Brexit. They're all very, very intrigued and even, dare I say, excited in a professional sense by this story. So um, check it out for yourself. I, 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 um, I read it myself this morning. With, with a growing sense of, well, two feelings, actually. One, ah, uh, OK, that bit makes sense now. And secondly, oh, my God, spending all that time championing ordinary people while I'm speaking about the hedge funds now or some of the big supporters of Brexit, very, very wealthy supporters of Brexit, claiming that it was somehow a, a, a reflection or a championing of ordinary people. Well, all the time they were potentially making hundreds of millions of pounds out of the fluctuations in the currency market. 10.58 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I am, well, enlightened, I think, today by the uh, 
a conversation we took from Tara on the question of Heathrow. I'm going to squeeze in one more. Mark, we've only got about a minute, but I, I just want to hear your voice and hear what you've got to say about this third runway. James, very good morning. Thanks for having me on. I've just recently retired after 42 years in the airline industry. So, that was the last fellow, the bloke in Nice, had been in the airline industry for 42 years. That's a bit of a coincidence. <laughs> Well, if he's, a B, if he's a BA captain, I might have known him because I worked um, primarily in the operation, so right up to the okay. craft of work beyond. So um, I just very quickly wanted to talk about the economic situation. You know, there's about a quarter of a million jobs uh, directly and indirectly uh, involved at Heathrow, and, and I didn't hear that being mentioned, you know, the security of those jobs and the future prosperity. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think I've been persuaded this hour. I think, I've, I think I'm now pro third runway. Yeah, and also, the, the, even the captain talked with a slight lack of depth of knowledge. You know, every aircraft... Steady. <laughs> <laughs> he knows about how to fly an aeroplane, I have absolutely no doubt. But what goes on in terms of, you know, the companies that run airlines, and I can talk about my company, we employed revenue enhancement specialists that try to fill every goddamn seat, every square foot of hold space with cargo and mail and so on and so on. But the broader global benefits, again, may be a subject for future discussion. Mm. When you go to Marks and Sparks or Waitrose and you pick up your baby sweet corn and your mange too, you have to think where they come from. They come from places like Kenya. They're air freighted in. So there's a lot of employment, not just in, in London and Heathrow, around the world. You know, there are farmers producing these things. They're air freighted in. They're distributed out, you know, within 10 hours of arriving at Heathrow. So it's not such a shallow subject as you think. There's a lot I, I don't know. I, I didn't think it was shallow. I've, I've been on an absolute journey today. I, I can't remember the last time I had a conversation about Heathrow that proved so fruitful and, and enlightening. Of course, none of it changes the fact that Boris Johnson is a barefaced liar. I think we can all agree about that, can't we, Mark? Well, yes, he represents the one up from where I live, and I wouldn't trust him to run me a bath, <laughs> never mind a government department. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming up to 11 o'clock. Um, you might say that, Mark. I couldn't possibly do anything but agree completely. Finished now with Heathrow for, for the time being, and I quite like it when I, when I feel at the end of the hour that I know considerably, or I understand things a lot better than I did at the beginning of the hour. Um, the danger is, of course, that the pendulum will swing back if, if somebody from the other side of the argument as informed and um, uh, articulate as Tara were to ring in. But I, I just, I'm going to play with my beep again now, because we, 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 we've, we've got it working, and I, I just want to play a game to see whether or not you can decide which beep is what what this beep is is disguising okay so just bear with me it is from a deleted page of a prominent politician's website okay so i'm not telling you who it is i'm going to bleep any mention of the prominent politician's name and i just want you to see if you can decide who it is all right no to a third runway at heathrow is firmly against plans to build a third runway at Heathrow Airport and is campaigning against it on behalf of <laughs> residents. I'm also beeping out the constituency because, you know, the calibre of listener to this programme is rather higher than the average and you'd probably be able to work out from the constituency who the, uh, who the politician is. Many local people will be devastated by the government's decision to proceed with a third runway. The expansion will result in thousands of additional flights, increased noise and more pollution for thousands of people. There is still a long way to go before the runway is built and is continuing to campaign against it. Some of the concerns which has raised during her campaign include noise, flight numbers, I'm, I'm not going to read it all, we'll be here all day, night flights, emissions, road traffic, transparency. Go on, have a guess. Even my colleagues don't know. They're looking at me with, are oh, they like, they're like little meerkats. Uh, they're just utterly excited and waiting for the big reveal. Yes, <laughs> yeah, you're right. Theresa May. Theresa May, Beth got it right. Ivan and Alex, I'm afraid, are lagging behind on that. Theresa Blooming May. Got it. I just don't know anymore, really. It's, it's like complete... Not corruption, that's the wrong word, isn't it? But it, there's no such thing as conviction. Absolutely no conviction. Oddly enough, I am now in favour of the third runway at Heathrow, having taken one very brilliant call from one very brilliant listener. But <laughs> to be Prime Minister or, or Foreign Secretary, uh, waving through something that you swore blind to your own constituents you'd oppose. Oh, well. Seven minutes after 11. We will, I think, change pace completely now and indeed change direction. If you want to find out more about that astonishing investigation by Bloomberg, I've just 
retweeted the entire article from my account at Mr. James OB is the moniker you need to get stuck into that. I do miss